Phil Keggy has a new album out with Jeff Johnson called Cappadocia. It's like this real serene music, really good to listen to and kind of just be serene. So if you're into such things, uh, uh, he's such a friend of this class, wanted to let you know. Shout out to our internet folks, Tom Cushman, who heads that team out in the hinterlands. I think they just got like this massive weather bomb. So they're probably not at church today. Maybe they're tuned in. Uh, we love you guys. Thank you for being a part via the internet. Thanks to all the internet people who do it. And then the third bit of news, Becky and I were, were in, and two of our spring break girls from Baylor were in uh, Guatemala on Friday and Saturday. And by the way, we got to see the home where the very first oven got put in by this class. It's so exciting. And, and the woman, uh, I've got a video that when Brent gets back tomorrow, I'll get him to put together for y'all. She just thanked y'all so much and thanked God on your behalf and talked about how incredible it's changed her world. And so we've got that uh, video uh, footage. Now, let's shift gears. I'm really excited about this class. I'm having to make a little transformation in the class because I originally conceived of this as a book I wanted to write about the greatness of God. And as I thought, you know, if you're going to write a book, there are eight gazillion books on the greatness of God. That's, I mean, who needs to write another book on that? Like, what do I have to offer that's not already in all of these other books? So I thought, well, I'm going to look at it from the perspective of a lawyer examining God's CV, curriculum vitae. I thought that'll give a little different buzz to it, a little different approach. It'll make it a little unique or, or novel. And, and then I thought, you know, I, I've been plagued by this because most people don't know what a CV is. And if they do, they call it a resume. And so I'm not sure that that was really the right thing. So I've, I, one of the people who reads my lessons as they, it's on the email list is a, a law professor at, at Emory University. And she emailed me recently and she said uh, uh, you do a great job and I really appreciate this but I'm a better writer than you are and do you realize how bad your title is and uh, she was a lot more diplomatic the way she said it but that was the the way I read it <laughs> and uh, um, and I said well what do you got in mind and she said you know what you're really doing is if you want people to pay attention to this and see this, is how about this as a title? Is God guilty of fraud? A lawyer examines God's claims and God's actions, or something like that. I thought, yeah, now that's got some buzz to it. Is God guilty of fraud? He says he's one, and then he says he's three. Come on, which is it? He says he's love, and then he tells everybody to go wipe out AI, men, women, and children. What is it? It's, it's, it's got, so we're morphing this class from the greatness of God, examining God's CV, to is God guilty of fraud, examining his claims and actions. And, and in the process of that, I hadn't morphed it yet. So you've got this slide up here, but you're going to see it kind of change. Okay, so just fair warning as we continue to work through this. This morning's class is built around the idea of, of a question. The question is a simple one. Three words. Where is God? I mean, people have been looking for God forever. As long as we've got written records, we've got people searching and looking for God. I think that, that the idea of where God is is not one that's just new to our generation. Shaman have gotten famous for being people who can find or encant the presence of God. Spiritists can, can find and, and use crystals and all sorts of things to find the essence and the presence of God, or so they claim. You can find people who by incantation claim they can make God or the spirit world appear 
be active, interact. If you look at different cultures, back in Israel's day, one of the big things to do was to take a tree and uh, cut it and go find the highest hilltop you could and put up this tree pole. Recognizing God in the tree, but even more so by putting it on a high place, getting closer to the heavens where the gods would see it and pay attention. A lot of people are abuzz about Viking culture now because of the popular TV show on, on the History Channel, the Vikings. They've got zero qualms about killing a goat, drinking the blood and smearing it all over them so the gods of Valhalla will pay attention. Heavens, in a couple of episodes, they kill people. Smear their blood so that the gods will pay attention and they can seek the presence of the gods in their city, their town, their mission, their effort. People have been doing this forever. One of the oldest stories of the search for God is found in the Bible before Abraham. It's a story we call the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel takes place on the plains of Shinar, which is near modern Baghdad. If you look at the story, it's in Genesis 11. Let's go to it. And I want to read it to you. And there's a specific reason I want to read it to you. I am convinced we don't read the story right. We read it like 21st century Westerners who've been reading books like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Terry Brooks' Shauna Ra series, uh, any number of different books. Or we read it like a little novelette or a short story. We read it with a Western mindset and that's wrong. So let's read it together. First, you just be you. Then I'm going to push you to dissect it a little bit more. Okay? Here's the story. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as, a people, as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. So they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. They had tar pits, bitumen available. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we dis be dispersed over the whole face of the whole earth. Now the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they're one people, they all have one language. This is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing they propose to do will be impossible to them. So come, let's go down there and confuse their language so they won't understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth. They left off the building of the city. Therefore, uh, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now, I don't want to get into how we read this in our language beyond simply giving you a couple of illustrations. We read this, and when it talks about the, they be dispersed over the whole earth, we think in terms of the entire planet. Yet... All of the Eretz or all of the land in that ancient language and in that ancient time and culture is referencing 
any number of different things. I mean, I can, we do the same thing today. I can tell you, look, um, uh, the parade on 1960 has traffic messed up all over the place. But all over the place, I don't mean that all of a sudden in Gangshu, China, the traffic's messed up because of what happened in 1960. I'm just talking about, hey, it's all over the place. That language is acceptable language. All over the earth here is a reference to all over that land. Now, maybe this is a, a, a narrative of how people dispersed and became aborigines in Australia. But I don't think that's what it's talking about. I think this story has a very specific point and it makes that point. But if we're not careful, we read it with our eyes and Western concepts and we come up with a different picture. If we go back to the PowerPoint, please. We come up with a different picture. We think that what they did is this is every human being that's left after the flood and they've all gotten together and they've all found one place and they're going to build this massive city and tower with its top going into the heavens and it's got God concerned because anything that they're conceiving of they might be able to do. So he's going to wipe them out and stop the process of building that tower before it gets up too high. Now, that may be flavored by the way I learned this story when I was in Sunday school. Because I learned this story amidst tall buildings that seem to reach up into the sky. I learned this story knowing that airplanes fly up even higher than that. I learned this story knowing that we could have a rocket ship take us to the moon. And if God is in the heavens, he must be even higher than that. Man, they were building one honking big building. That was my thought as a young, young boy. And then God says anything they're going to do is going to be possible. I thought, man, if we didn't all speak different languages, we could build a tower that tall. That's reading this story wrong. So I want us to take a step back and really read this story for what it says because the story has an incredible lesson and moral and point to it that we tend to not embrace because it just seems almost childish, almost, yeah, that's that stuff before Abraham and we're not sure how good that stuff really is. It just doesn't strike us as the same way and, and it's just a different time and pre-civilization, and, and, and we just move it to the side because of that. I want to take it from the side, and I want to plant it in the middle of this lesson, and I want us to look at it together because it's got an incredibly important point, and we miss it if we can't climb into the thinking of people who would have read this story a thousand plus years before Jesus. First of all, so much of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those first five books of Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch, those books, so many of the words are loan words and concepts that harken back not only to Israel's early days, but also to Egypt. Because the early Israelites had much back and forth with Egypt. If there was a terror, they'd go to Egypt for safety. If there was a famine, they'd go to Egypt for food. They would back and forth with Egypt quite often. And because of that, the vocabularies became very similar. I'm teaching this. If you're watching this on the internet, we are in Houston, Texas. It is a suburb about eight hours south east of Lubbock. And Houston and a good bit of Texas, you can go up to a lot of people and you can say, que pasa? And they're going to know you're asking how they're doing. And they're going to say, gracias. And you're going to know they're saying, thank you. Because those are words 
that have a, a, a Spanish origin and we're so close to, to Mexico and we have such a Latin American presence here that they become part of our vocabulary. If I say, adios, you know I'm leaving. But if I'm in China and I say to someone, que pasa? <laughs> Buenos dias! the odds are less that they're going to know what I'm saying. However, if I say to them, ni hao, they'll know I'm asking how they're doing. Gracias may not get there, but shishia will. Our languages are affected by where we are. This story, unlike most of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that are steeped in Egyptian and Israelite concepts, this story is steeped in concepts found in Mesopotamia, the opposite direction of Egypt, near what is now modern Iraq. So these are stories, and th th this is vocabulary and concepts of stones made out of bricks that are baked and bitumen that are common in a different direction. And it's appropriate we look to Mesopotamia to understand this story. That's where it's placed linguistically and geographically. The writer tells us, Plains of Shinar, that's modern Iraq, near Baghdad. The writer is telling us, this is not an Egyptian story. Now, archaeologists have gone back and they understand what towers were built there. They're what we call ziggurats. And a ziggurat was built. That ziggurat you're looking at there is about 10 stories high. But the language in Mesopotamia, before they had skyscrapers and airplanes and such on a flat plane that's something in, Me in Mesopotamian language the ziggurats the tops reached into the heavens because ten stories was a lot and that's that they weren't used to skyscrapers they hadn't seen the Chrysler building much less um, yeah, something taller than that. The Empire State Building. The Twin Towers back in their day. The Sears Tower in Chicago. They hadn't seen those things. So to them, that's like reaches up to the heavens. I grew up in Lubbock. <laughs> I get this. By the way, did you know Lubbock is found in prophecy, in the prophecy of Isaiah? And it's basically given a description as being heaven on earth. Because Isaiah talks about how the mountains will be brought low and the valleys be lifted up and everything will be flat. That's Lubbock, I'm just saying. So here you've got a ziggurat, you've got a tower that reaches into the heavens. And the reason they built these towers was to entice the gods to come down because on top they'd do a sacrifice, an altar. So the gods would come down and then they would take the staircase down to earth. And this is great. And do you realize what this means for business? I.e. tourist trap. You're going to have vendors down there selling ziggurats on keychains. You're going to have people, hey, 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 you know, here, buy this. And the gods, when they come down, they'll listen to you. People are going to, quote, make a name for themselves, a reputation. And they're going to be able to do all sorts of things that they conceive of because they're all working together. They all have the same language. They're united in purpose even though the purpose is not a good one. So when we read this story, we need to read it in its culture, but it goes deeper than just understanding some of the words. It goes into how the story is told. 
In the 21st century, in journalism school, people are taught, quote, don't bury your lead. In other words, take your point and put it right at the beginning. Our newspapers aren't just articles, they've got headlines. They grab your attention and tell you what it's about. In law, in the courtroom, you're taught primacy and recency. The thing you say first and the thing you say last is what most people will remember. What's in the middle, they forget. That's why as trial lawyers, first time every day, my first point, I want it to be one I hope that jury remembers. My last point at the end of the day, I want it to be one I hope that jury remembers. If I've got stuff, I don't care if they remember it or not, I just have to get it into the record. I bury it in the middle of the day after they've had pizza and they're sleeping. Okay? That's just what you do. That is exactly opposite of how things were done in a certain literary style that was used in ancient days. And I want to teach you about that, so we need to go back to school together. By the way, who here is in elementary school? Do we have any elementary school kids that are bold enough to raise their hands? No. Oh, yes, we do. Young lady, what is your name? Shout it out loud. Rebecca? Okay, can, did, will your mom let you come up here for just a minute so we can ask you some questions? Can we get Rebecca? Will y'all give her a hand? Oh, Rebecca, that's so nice of you. Oh, look, she even runs. I used to do that when I was young. <laughs> Without groaning. Okay, Rebecca, I'm going to hold this up here. Come right over here so everybody can see you. Can you tell everybody hello? Hi. All right. And your name is? Rebecca. And what grade are you in, Rebecca? Second grade. Second grade. That's amazing. Okay, I have a very important question for you. And there's not a wrong answer. You can say yes or no, okay? You ready? You see what that little girl, can you see that little girl from where you are? Do you see what she's holding up there? Can you see that? Do you, know, do you know what that is? A chalkboard. Oh, I'm so proud of you, Rebecca. Everybody, thank Rebecca. You can go back to your mom now, sweetie. That's fantastic. She got it. And because of that, your mom is going to give you anything you want for lunch. Um, that's, that's healthy. And uh, a lot of kids don't know what that is. I found that out when I taught this in Jersey Village. The guy was a fourth grader like, never seen one of those four in my life because they've got smart classrooms now and stuff so I may have to come up with something new but we're going back to school for a moment and we're using a chalkboard because I grew up in the 60s so with that here's your new word chiasm and it's not new if you've been in a lot of my classes because we've covered a little bit of this before but I want to make sure we're all on the same page chiasm or chiasm it comes from the Greek word chi which if you were in a fraternity or a sorority or you are a Greek major, you might know. But the Greek chi is basically, let's get that one off of there. We don't need it up there right now. The Greek chi, there we go. Get rid of it. There we go. The Greek chi. <laughs> Just saying. 45 minutes later. And that's why I was almost late to Jersey Village this morning. Um, the Greek word chiasm, I just put it up there as an X, okay? That's the Greek letter chi, it's an X. So chiasm is built off of that idea of it's like a chi, like a Greek X. And what that means is the start and the end are about the same. So you can fold it over. Or you can fold it sideways. It works better for my purposes to fold it sideways. So if you draw a line down the middle and you fold it over sideways, there it goes. <coughs> Excuse me. You've got it where the top and the bottom mirror each other. You follow? Okay, that's the way their story's read. And the punch of the story is in the middle. Not at the beginning and not at the end. But the beginning and the end, they mirror each other all the way down till you get to that midpoint. And that midpoint is the punchline. It's the point of the story. It's what you need to know. 
So now, instead of just reading Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, as a short story or a vignette, let's read it as a chiasm. And here it is. It starts out, the whole earth has one language. Now, if that's the start, that's going to be at the end. Point number two, the people use bricks to build a tower. If that's point two, it's going to be the point right before the end. Point three, the people use, uh, whoops, there we go. The people do this for their reputation, to keep them together. It's a common thing. The middle, God comes down to examine and to judge. Now the story backs out and we move to the end and the end will mirror from that center point what you've read. So right before the center point, people do it for their reputation and to stay together, right? So the next part of the story is God disperses them because of their attitude, because of who they were, because of their reputation. So the people are doing it for their reputation to stay together, but in fact, because of their reputation, their attitude, who they were, God disperses them. So they don't get to stay together. Their actions were one, God's was a different one. What would be the next level? They had used bricks to build a tower, point two. So the next level, as we back out, God's going to unbrick them. And disperse them. And the word for God confusing their language is, is brick spelled backwards. God unbricks them. NBL instead of LBN. If you put them into English letters. Noon bait Lamed instead of Lamed bait Noon. We should be precise. We're on the internet and they may watch this in Israel and think, he's from Lubbock. Um, God unbricks them and disperses them. So they'd use bricks to build a tower, but God uses unbricks and takes them and their tower apart, stops the tower from being built by dispersing the people. And then the final line, which mirrors the front line, the front one, the whole earth had one language. At the end, the earth has many languages. Now the point of that is the middle. Don't read it as a novel in a 21st century Westerner. And you see the middle is that God comes down to examine and to judge. They built this so that God would be their genie who when they rub the lamp, he's going to appear and do what they want him to do. God at their beck and call. God, they're going to be the, the, the name for themselves. Big reputation. Yeah, man, go over there to the plains of Shinar. They built this tower that goes up into the heavens. And they sacrifice on it and the gods come down and co-mingle. Whoa, aren't they incredible people? And God says, no, 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 no. God's coming down, but he's coming down to judge them. He's not coming down to be their bellboy, their genie. And that's the moral to the story. God's not our genie. God doesn't come down when we ask him in ways that we ask him to come down to do the things we ask him to do. God reveals himself to be very different from that. And anybody who is reading that Genesis story knows it's different because the very first line of the very first chapter of the very first column in the very first scroll of Moses' writings. Bareshit bara Elohim et hashamayam va'et ha'eretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now if God created the heavens and the earth, that means God was there before the heavens and the earth. God was there before anything was created. God has an existence outside of the cosmos, outside of nature, outside of the natural, outside of everything that we know of in our material sense. God exists totally independent. I mean, Isaiah the prophet, through that microphone, God said, I form light and create darkness. So you want to know where is God? 
Answer number one, if you want to draw a circle around all of nature, all of the cosmos, all of it, whether it's material, whether it's thought that is made possible through the neurons and synapses of material goods, anything in existence in our nature, our cosmos, we know that God is above it. God is outside of it. He is super it. He is superior to it. He is beyond it. Supra or super means beyond. And God is beyond nature. That means that God is supernatural. And that's the meaning of the word. That God exists outside of nature. The rules of nature don't bind God. God's not bound by gravity, by time, by space. God exists independent of that. God transcends that. Hence the big theological word, God is transcendent. This is the transcendent God. You want to impress your friends at lunch? What did you talk about today at church? The transcendence of God. <laughs> really? Well, absolutely. That's what God is transcendent. He is beyond this universe. He exists independent of the universe. He exists independent of what you and I think. I think God's this. Well, I think God's that. It really doesn't matter in a sense because He is who He is whether you think He is or not. I like a God who is... Well, I don't care what kind of God you like. I'll tell you, there is a God. In this sense, God's responsible for the universe. God made the watch. My son is uh, uh, one of the most avid readers I've ever known in my life. Maybe next to mom. Um, and he uh, loves to read about everything. But among all of his reading is the history of math. And he was talking to me recently about how Newton... He said, it's just mind-blowing that here Newton could be at Cambridge... And I think there may have been a subtle dig there since my son got his PhD at Oxford and it's like he couldn't even get, Newton couldn't even get into Oxford and he still did this because they were quite competitive about that. It's kind of like Texas Tech and Harvard, you know, couldn't get into Harvard. So, you know, had to go. it's just that natural competition that exists. And, um, and uh, uh, so, so here you've got Newton who figures out hundreds of years ago without the benefit of calculators, without the benefit of modern science, he figures out the force of gravity and the, the way that a, a molecule or atom will pull to it because of that gravitational pull, how matter pulls. And yet, there's also a pulling force as well. As the electrons are spinning in orbit, there's something that pulls and there's a ratio between the, the gravitational accumulation and the opposite force. And he says that ratio, Dad, is so precise down to like the, the he, uh, Newton had figured it out, but scientists have figured out the ratio now down to the billionth or whatever of a decimal. He went beyond that. I don't remember the exact number. But he said, uh, he says, and, and if it were off, if it changed even a small fraction, this tension between what pulls matter together and what propels matter apart, if that ratio changed by even a billionth of a percentage point, life as we know it would never exist, couldn't exist. We got nothing. God set this, this watch up. He set these designs. He set these dials in a way that makes all of this work. That's the transcendent God. But if we make God the watchmaker and nothing more, then we're deists. Deism has God making the watch and then just watching. Had a bad pun. 
God makes the watch and then just sits back and never dabbles in it. Well, yes, God makes the watch. God is transcendent. He is outside this universe, but he's also imminent. And imminent means that God is the reason the universe continues to exist. He's holding it together. He is the, 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 the glue, the, 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 the force that keeps everything running and keeps everything together. Paul said it this way in Colossians 1. He said, For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones or dominions, rulers and authorities, all things. He's imminent. He's transcendent. He created all things. He's before all things. But also in Him all things hold together. He didn't just set up a watch and start watching. He's the reason the watch is continuing to tick. He's the reason the watch continues to work. He's the reason things continue to exist. He is the fabric that is holding the tapestry together. And so if we go back to our picture, yes, God is transcendent, but God is also imminent. You find him holding all of nature together. Now, that is a truth about God, but we need to understand some extra details about it. By the way, if someone said to you, what are you really learning in class? The answer to your question properly is, in, in a seminary setting, we would be talking in a systematic theology class. This is a class of trying to put together a study of God that makes a, a picture of things. It's just we're doing it as, as lay people instead of in a seminary class. Okay? So you want to feel really good about your world? You are studying systematic theology right now. Okay? This is it. If you're not getting this... Don't worry about it. 80% of the people who take systematic theology in seminary don't get it. They just get through it. You're doing great, okay? So just hang on. What I want you to understand is, think of God being imminent as the glue that's holding everything together. But let me draw some other comments to show how that's different. We also speak of God being omnipresent. That means God is everywhere. That's true. That's different than saying he's imminent. Imminent means he's holding it together like uh, he, he's the reason it continues to exist. Omnipresent means he's everywhere. And he is that. It's just a different concept a little bit, closely related. But I mean, we know that from Psalm 139. Where do I go from your spirit? Where do I flee from your presence? If I go up into the sky, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths of the earth, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand leads me, your right hand holds me. If I say, hey, okay, I, wanna, I want God not to see me. I'm going to cover myself in darkness. I want the light about me to be night. Doesn't matter. Even the darkness isn't dark to God. The night's as bright as day. Darkness is as light with God. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. That's different than saying he's what holds it together. But it's an important concept for us as we're trying to understand who God is and where God is. Now I want to distinguish non-biblical concepts. This is not teaching pantheism. That God is everything. Or animism. That God is in everything that's alive. I don't worship the water because, oh, God's everywhere, so I guess God is the water. Excuse me while I have some God. I feel divine. No, God is omnipresent, but that doesn't mean God is the water. I don't worry about killing a cow because God is a cow. God's not a cow, but that doesn't mean he's not present. You see the distinction? So 
the point of this is that the, the Tower of Babel story is a marvelous understanding and lesson that God isn't our genie, but yet God does descend to earth. So the biblical picture is, is God's outside of all of nature, but God's also imminent holding it together. God's also omnipresent. But in some particular ways, God has made his presence particularly known. He is particularly present in our midst in certain ways. This is the miracle of the incarnation of Jesus. God taking on material form in order to live and to walk among us and do something for humanity that a human had to do, namely pay for our sins. And so God becomes human. This is why Paul said it this way in Philippians 2. He was telling the Philippians to let that affect their attitude, to have the same attitude which Jesus had. It was one of, of serving and giving. He says, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, something he had to hang on to, but he emptied himself and he took the form of a servant being born in the likeness of humans. And that's what Jesus is. So Jesus is God present. And if you want to see God, look to Jesus. John said it another way. John said, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In the beginning. All things were made through Him. So He existed before these things were made. He's transcendent. All things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And then in verse 14, the Word, the transcendent God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen His glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So let's go back to Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel. And let's look at it again. The whole earth, or remember, I, I think this is cast within this area. The whole earth had one language. They all spoke the same language. They all had the same words. And as people migrated from the east, those who migrated from the east found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. And they said to one another, hey, Let's make bricks. Let's burn them thoroughly. Very Mesopotamian. Brick for stone. Bitumen for mortar. You know, they're in the, the plain of Shinar. They, they don't have mountains. They don't have stone. It's, 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 so that's what they do. They said, uh, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. It's a ziggurat. Let's make a name for ourselves. Let's enhance our reputation. Lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Or we'll just wander aimlessly around. We're going to make a, a location. We're going to become famous. This is going to be us. No more nomad. They're doing this to get the Lord to come down at their beck and call. But the Lord comes down to see the city and the tower which they built. And the Lord says they're one people, they've one language. This is only the beginning of what they're going to do. We know where this story ends. We know how they're going to try and command God. We know how they're going to capitalize on this. We know everything that's going to come. And nothing's going to be impossible for them. That's kind of a good reading of it. But it's, that the idea is they're going to be able to do these things. We know where this ends. So let's go down. And confuse their language so they don't understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them. He, he debricked them from there over the face of the earth. They left off building the city 
Its name is called Babel because God confused the language of the earth and God dispersed them. Here's the thing. When we try to make God our genie, when we try to make God appear at our beck and call, we run the risk of incurring his righteous judgment because he's going to come down and he's going to see what we're doing, but he decides where he appears and how he appears. And nothing we're doing is hidden from him anyway. So you may not be thinking the Tower of Babel, but let me put it into a story for your life and mine. This idea that I'm going to construct a God that's going to approve of my plans and I'm going to build things around him and I'm going to give him lip service. I'm going to acknowledge him. I want to say, oh, I like this God and here's the way I want to live and God's going to approve it because my heart is good. And I construct this idea of God and I need to know I'm not doing it blindly. That God knows exactly what's going on. And he knows left to my own devices that I'll go to an end that's not a good end. And God has zero qualms about paying you and me a visit saying I'm going to destroy what you're trying to do before it destroys you. And it left the people babbling. Blah, 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 blah. And they didn't understand things. And their plans came to zero. To naught. So here's what I want to talk about. And it'll be a couple of weeks before we get here. Because next week we've got a special guest who's coming in to speak to the Spanish people. Dr. Gary Habermas. And I'm going to interview him for class. So we're a couple weeks out. But I really want to talk about how God has come to earth and revealed himself. On his terms even beyond his transcendence and his eminence. We'll talk more about God coming in Jesus, but we'll talk more about God indwelling in the believer through his spirit. And we'll talk about God indwelling through his body, his church. So that is to come, but now here's your take action now, your points for home. Point number one, I want to see God as God. We sing this song in church. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to see God. I want to see God as God. Not God that I make up. Not God of my liking, not God of my imaginations. I want to see the one true God who is transcendent, who is holding everything together, and who is present in our midst. And I want to see Him as God. The Psalms say if we walk in holiness, we behold His face. When you're faced today with some choices... And today you're going to be faced with choices. You can do something that's unholy. Or you can do something that's holy. You will be faced with that choice today. We're faced with that choice every day. I want within your spirit, within your heart, within your mind, I want you to remember this. Do you want to see God? Do you want to see Him more fully? Do you want to understand Him more fully? If so, make the holy choice. Because as sure as two plus two is four, when you do holiness, you behold the face of God. You choose the unholy choice, less view of God. So what do you want? Make your choice. I want to see God as God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I want to see God, the God that is. I want to see God as God. Point number two, I want to glorify God. God as God. I want to praise and worship God as God. I don't want to praise and worship God as something I think of. I don't want to praise and worship God as, oh gee, 
This is a good song. I want to give him glory and honor and praise. I love this passage from Rabbi Paul. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I mean, he didn't just say, PTL. Praise the Lord. I mean, he's like, man, king, and not just king, king of the ages. Immortal. Invisible. The only God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I like that. Reminds me of a song. Mom, you and I may be the only ones in here. I guess my sisters would know it. And some of you will know this song. Do you remember this? Hold on, let me... Anybody know this song? Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His power and His love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Tell of His might, sing of His grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space. Whose chariots of wrath the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Yeah, you hadn't heard me sing. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Oh, frail children of dust, and feeble is frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. I want to glorify God as God. Point number three, last take-home point. I'm going to seek his presence on his terms, not mine. He's not my genie. I'm not going to rub the bottle and get three wishes. I understand his terms. I understand that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I understand that we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I'm embracing it. I'm there. And I want to see him more. I want to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. So we sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And all of the people praise Him. He has shown His bountiful love for us. He has come at the transcendent God who the eminence holds us all together without whom we don't even exist, has come to us personally and called us and redeemed us and paid for a price of our sins that we could walk in fellowship with Him. And we just get so distracted with this world, we lose track of that. And I don't want to be that way. I want to have laser focus on this and I want it to change the way I live by the power of God. So I hope you'll join me in that. Can I bless you in the name of Jesus before we depart? Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to bless all who hear your words in the midst of anything that I'm saying or failing to say, Father, that we will behold you in your glory more than we ever have before. Then we will seek to follow you more than we ever have before. And we will seek to love you more than we ever have before. And we will seek to understand you more than we ever have before. That you will transform us into the image of your Son. Moving us from grace to grace as your Spirit changes who we are. Into who we can be in your glorious presence. 
by the might of your love and the blood of your Son through whom we can even approach you and say, Amen. Amen. See you guys next Sunday. Thank you for being here.